Brett Jensen is one of my favorite resources when it comes to biotech investing. We sat down a few days ago to discuss some of his favorite small cap biotech companies that have near term, mostly fourth quarter catalysts. We're going to talk about what those companies are and why Brett likes them so much and what Brett considers to be an attractive risk reward scenario when it comes to investing in biotech and how Brett would work at companies like these into his overall broad portfolio strategy. Welcome to Investor in the Family Radio. My name is Brian Bain, and I am your host. In Investor in the Family Radio, we believe that every dollar and minute we spend is an investment in something, and together, we want to make the best investments that we can, so thank you so much for joining us. And remember, our goal is to help you learn to invest financially and in all of life. You can always find more at InvestorInTheFamily.com, and subscribe to the podcast at iTunes and the Google Play Store. And if you would like a PDF, my detailed show notes in PDF format from today's show, simply text the word Family Notes, one word, Family Notes, to the number 44222, or sign up at investorinthefamily.com for the email list, and you'll get an email with a link to these show notes as well as all of our other sign-up bonuses all in one place, so be sure to enjoy that as well. How much time do you currently spend trying to figure out your investments? Are you tired of spinning your wheels, attempting to conduct research that you really don't have time for? And if we're honest, you might not actually be qualified to do. Brett Jensen is the man behind the Biotech Forum, the number two premium marketplace service on Seeking Alpha. He's also a top 5% ranked analyst according to tip ranks. Do you like owning companies that get acquired? So does Brett. Are you anxious about the current election season and how it may impact your portfolio? Perhaps it's time you put a portion of your portfolio on autopilot with Brett as your guide. Visit BiotechForumSA.com for more information. That's BiotechForumSA.com. SA as in Seeking Alpha. BiotechForumSA.com. And I hope you enjoyed today's interview with Brett Jensen. Well, hey, Brett, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Brian. Again, always a joy to have you here with us. And, you know, we've talked about a few things recently. We talked about um, biotech a few weeks ago as far as kind of big overall broad level news. We've talked about some insider investor type ideas a few weeks ago. But today we've talked about diving in and talking about what are some small cap biotechs to have biotech stocks that have some significant catalysts coming up in the fourth quarter. And uh, I'd love to hear some your thoughts as far as um, what could be available there. Uh, great to share some ideas, Brian. Uh, I'm always a big believer that not only you have to have a, a identify a small biotech stock that has an attractive risk reward uh, profile. A lot of traits I look for as far as solid balance sheets, multiple shots on goal, strong analyst support, uh, partnerships with larger industry players, and obviously. Uh, good technology. But one of the things that investors should keep in mind, unless there are some upcoming catalysts that are near term, that stock is probably just going to go ahead and ebb and flow with whatever sentiment is on uh, the biotech sector at the moment. So it's always helpful to combine the attractive risk reward profile with upcoming definable potential catalysts. Now, I've got about five names today to share with uh, listeners uh, that I find attractive uh, based on standalone basis and just what they're doing with their portfolio, but also have upcoming catalysts, which I uh, think is very, are very likely to be positive. Well, let's start with a, a company called Eaglet. It's EGLT trades on the NASDAQ, about a $200 million market cap company. They have a uh, abuse deterrent version of uh, morphine, uh, and as we all know, the whole op- drug uh, overdose and deaths in this country from opioids has become a very big issue as the number of deaths and overdoses have exponentially shot up over the last five years to the point where it's even became a political campaign point. Uh, their stock has been kind of hit a little bit in the last week because another company called Pain Therapeutics, uh, they had an abuse-resistant oxycodone uh, capsule option called Remoxy uh, that got a complete response letter uh, from the FDA, and the stock went down by about two-thirds. But Eagle's offer, uh, offering or product was called uh, A-R-Y-M-O-E-R, extended release, now, the chances of it getting rejected by the FDA are pretty much nil, uh, simply because they had an ADCOM uh, panel on August 4th 
that adcom panel voted 18 to 1 for recommendation and two of the three, three ways to uh, go ahead and deliver the drug was voted uh, that it should give the abuse uh, deterrent label by 18 to 1 and the other one uh, 16 to 3. So not only do I expect it to be approved, but I expect it to get that all important label. Uh, that is going to be a very positive catalyst, and that should happen on October 14th. Uh, the next uh, stock we want to talk to talk about is a co- company called Synergy Pharmaceuticals, uh, SGYP. Uh, it's in the gastrointestinal space. Uh, it has two compounds. One is in a mid-stage uh, development. The other is in late stage. It's called palatinitide. And it has an FDA approval date uh, meeting of January 29th, I believe, uh, for idiopathic chronic constipation, which is a pretty decent sized market. Based on trial results, this would be another one that would shock me if it doesn't get approved. It seems to be a more uh, improved version of a a compound called Linzess which is marketed by Ironwood uh, Pharma, does about $450 million a year in annual sales. Uh, that company believes that drug will do a billion dollars in annual sales by 2020. Uh, Plegnotide has the same effect as Liness, but it seems to be slightly faster acting, and more importantly, uh, it has fewer side effects, most notably diarrhea. It also is in phase three uh, trials for IBS uh, C, which is basically irritable bowel syndrome with predominant constipation. Those trial results should be uh, out by the end of the fourth quarter. I expect them to be positive. I expect the company to get approval for that indication by the end of the first half of 2017 as well. Uh, it's about an eight to nine hundred million dollar market cap company. Uh, since it's a pure play on GI space, which Allegan and Shire and a few others are interested in, it's also a possible buyout target uh, once it gets approval or even possibly before then because everyone expects uh, the company to go ahead and garner FDA uh, green light. Uh, next company we're going to talk about is a company called Potolo Pharmaceuticals, PTLA. PTLA? About a billion, yeah, PTLA. Okay. Um, a little over a billion dollar market cap company. Uh, a couple months ago, the company got a complete response letter uh, about its drug candidate, Andexa, which is a universal uh, antidote to the new uh, uh, breed of anticoagulants like Elquis or Zoalta. Uh, but the cr- complete response letter was around manufacturing processes. It wasn't around the drug itself. Uh, the drug had very good trial results. And not only that, the industry wants this drug. Uh, 80,000 people will go into the ER and hospital because of reactions to anticoagulant. So the Pfizer of the world obviously want a universal antidote and makes selling their uh, product much easier. And because of this, uh, not only do I think the, the company gets this back on track and towards approval in the next month or two, but it also is a possible uh, buyout target. Uh, it has a new age anticoagulant in the pipeline as well as another candidate. Uh, the next company is called Dynavax Technology, DVAX, with about a $450 million market cap after today's rally. Uh, the company uh, went up, or the stock went up about 20% today because the company uh, came out and stated they've gone ahead and got the request from the FDA for further additional data points around its hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, and it expects to be able to provide that data in the original uh, FDA approval date of December 15th uh, is intact, uh, given trial results. And it was a very large trial, like 14,000 people. Uh, that clearly showed the vaccine was superior to the current standard in the market, a uh, greater protection rate, and as importantly, it was able to be delivered in two doses over a month rather than three doses over six months, uh, which should drastically improve the compliance rate with the current regimen, which is kind of abysmal 55%. Uh, that 
Standard does about $150 million to $200 million in quarterly revenues. The company also has an asthma drug uh, that is in development in phase two with AstraZeneca, as well as an oncology compound and a more early stage SD101. Uh, the company, based on approval, is worth at least twice what it's selling out just for the hepatitis uh, B vaccine. The rest are just a nice sum of parts, extra value. Uh, because of the saga with the FDA getting this approved over the last year or two, there seems to be a lot of pessimism whether this will finally be approved. Uh, but I think that it's marching towards approval and the stock is probably going to drift up into that approval date. And if approved, it's going either even higher. The last name I'd like to go ahead and discuss today is a company called Sempra, C-E-M-P, about a $1.2 billion market cap company. It has a antibiotic uh, called, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, uh, to be honest with you. It's one of those, like, you get 20 double word scores in Scrabble if you play it. Well, you're doing pretty uh, amazing on a pronunciation so far. Like, I try to type some of these down, and I have some of them I just can't figure out, so you're doing great. Yeah, it is, it is, that's the, one of the hardest things of being a biotech investor is actually getting <laughs> names right. Uh, but... Its product, its lead product, has a, a, a PUFA date or FDA approval date for the oral version and for the IV version. Both of the ones, December 27th, the other December 28th. I I always flip which which is which, but both versions should be approved. This company is aiming that product, the so-called superbugs. Those are the uh, microbes and other bacteria that are developing resistance to available bacterial uh, products uh, that are out there. Or, uh, and that's becoming a bigger problem because of overuse of uh, those type of antibiotics. Uh, the health, uh, the Department of Health estimates over 50,000 Americans die uh, in a hospital medical setting due to these superbugs. Uh, this Depending on which analyst you want to believe at the moment, uh, this drug has one to three billion dollars in peak annual sales potential. Uh, and because it's a pure play, I think that this is probably going to go ahead and be another possible buyout target. Uh, the antibiotic space is can again, uh, a little, uh, a little bit of interest here. Uh, Pfizer bought AstraZeneca's. Uh, antibiotic business for a little over a billion dollars, like a month, month and a half ago. And then Allegan just uh, spent like $1.5 billion to go ahead and uh, uh, license some antibiotic uh, drug candidates. And that actually came out, I think, today or the day before. Uh, so it's a very focused space as far as M, uh, M&A activity. Uh, the analyst price targets up in December are about 40 or so. It sells for about $22, $23 a share, uh, a, a good one that has a good catalyst uh, and a very important uh, niche product uh, in the war against the so-called super drugs. So those are my five ideas of very strong risk reward profile, small biotechs that also have a potential uh, catalyst that look to be like there'd be positive over the next couple of months. So tell me this, that's five names there. And I know that in your um, biotech investing approach, you like to build your portfolio. You focus on a lot of primarily putting a lot of good, solid blue chip, com- blue chip companies as the basis for your portfolio. Then you have a, a portion of your portfolio where you'll kind of like, I think you call it the shotgun investing approach. And so I guess each one of these companies for you would probably fall in the category of you know, 1% of your portfolio, smaller position with significant catalyst. Is that kind of where you'd put these in your portfolio or maybe a little larger or smaller? Pretty much, Brian. Well, we try to go ahead and advise in the biotech form portfolio that consists of our five top large cap uh, core positions, which we recommend either you wait 50 to between 50 and 75%, depending on your own risk preferences as an investor. And then we pair those with our 15 best small cap ideas, which are much lower weighted, obviously. Right. Awesome. Well, Brett, again, great to have you on the show. And this is a very high packed and high impact and actionable um, input. And hopefully this will be helpful for all of our listeners as they're looking to take action themselves. Well, thank you, Brian, again, for having me. I really appreciate it. Sure thing.
Well, I hope you enjoyed the interview today with Brett Jensen. Remember, you can get full show notes with links into the details at investorinthefamily.com. Don't forget to subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or the Google Play Store. And if you want to receive my detailed show notes from today, then be sure and text the word Family Notes to the number 44222 or visit investorinthefamily.com and sign up there. We'll make sure to get you a PDF of these notes as well as all of our other sign-up bonuses at the same time. This is Brian, and thanks for joining the family. The information and opinions contained on this podcast are for educational purposes only. The information does not consider the economic status or risk profile of any specific person. The information and opinions expressed should not be construed as investment trading advice and does not constitute an offer or an invitation to make an offer to buy and sell securities.